Can I see you in big? I want to see you all. Aha. Nice to have two screens. Okay, do you have do you see my screen? Okay, so let me see if I can also move this bar. Yes, perfect. So thank you, Victor, for your nice class. I was at about certain time theoretical and practical class on what is an input, what we can use inputs for, kind of signals we provide. Mm, now for an hour, more or less, because Oscar also needs to have more or less one hour. You need one hour, no more or less. Um, we will go on actually how we transform this knowledge into the real world how we make sensors or how we can use already made sensors. So the first part of the class is input devices one and two. In the documentation we will update just after the class. And on my side, it will be capacitive sensing and DIY input sensors. But before we jump onto that, I will give you some references and information on how to actually connect the sensor we might use on the board that you have. So actually, Arduinos, as you know, there are a lot of types, like the family of the Arduino is really big, and we consider different boards of Arduino. For example, some of you have the Arduino or the Northern Fuse, but all of them are compatible with the Arduino ID, ID and all the others to program them. But actually, how to connect pins to an Arduino? Let's go first with the example of a, just a straightforward Arduino, uh, how it looks like. <coughs> Arduino has a USB connector and the power connector. You see, when you have a, one of the first things you need to decide when you want to use a sensor and you need to check is, do, it, do I'm using an analog or a digital sensor? Because not all the boards can connect everything in all the pins. Uh, luckily, Arduino is quite straightforward onto that. and is one side is for digital connections. Actually, you can see all these pins are digital. It means you can process digital signals, both for input and output. And on the left side, you have the A0 to A5 connector that is for processing analog, analog, analog digital of inputs or outputs. It says, even if it says analog in, you can also do analog out. It's quite important, but this is the simplified view how we can check this kind of things. Actually, if you go for Arduino Uno pinout, if you check with any board, not MCU pinout, ESP32 pinout, they will state what kind of connections you can do on each one. And basically, you just can see this map with a lot of letters, weird numbers, etc. that basically this is the diagram of connections between the pins and the physical pins to connect from the microprocessor microcontroller, sorry, to the physical pinouts where you connect your jumper cables. So you can see here, for example, on the analog, the analog pins can be at the same time used as digital, analogs, and have what Victor was talking about, that is the analog to digital converter. This is more or less a must to have if you want to connect an analog sensor. So all the time that you look for a new board that you are maybe not, you're not using, you are doing you know, you know, you want to connect an analog sensor, you want to check for these ADC connectors. As you see here, for example, this top one, SCL, SDA, are also analog to digital converter, even so they are not staked by so on a normal Arduino Uno breakout. Don't, conf don't get too confused because of the numbers, but usually these schematics have also colors stating it clearly what kind of pin, digital pin or analog pin it is. So we can, actually we can see that in green, all the analogs are in green, all the digitals are in gray, and we have different types of digital. For example, PWM is a special type of digital processing. It's a much more accurate and better sampling of digital pins. <coughs> this is the connections. For example, let's go on the example of the Arduino that is an ESP compatible board. Actually, we just state the same kind of diagram, so it was easy for you to understand. Actually, we can see here that most of the pins of the Arduino are 
analog to digital, analog to digital, and at the same time, they're also digital. That's a, one of the main reasons because we use the ESK32, for example. But the bottom ones, none of them are analog to digital. So it's really important where to connect each kind of sensor. What happened, for example, with a breakout of node MCU with a ESP32? I want to remember you, for example, Arman doesn't have this node MCU with the ESP32, has the EST8266. That is a simple version of the ESP32. But let's go first with the SP32. The ESP32 has the digitals and has also the analogs. We can see here, for example, analog that ADC. Analog to digital, analog to digital, and, brown, and purples are also digital. So actually, most of the pins of the Node MCU ESP32 are analog to digital. One really interesting thing that we go later on to it is what is called the touch. Uh, you remember that Victor was talking about having the input, pull up, pull down resistors embedded into the board. Actually, the ESP32 has embedded some kind of advanced version of that. That means we can use these pins to actually connect touch sensors, also called capacitive sensing, just in a straightforward way. That is quite, quite interesting. Watch out that if you use the ESP, the Node MCU ESP8266, most of the pins are not analog. Actually, you only have one. So it's important if you want to connect different analog sensors to this board, you only have one port to connect them. So in this board, it's mostly, mostly me, mostly used for connecting digital sensors because it's a simplified uh, version of it. Edu? Yes? Uh, so in, the, in that pinout, there's no touch sensor. It's the A266 that does not have uh, the touch sensing capabilities? No. Touch sensing capabilities, all the microcontrollers have them, but you need to do it in, with a custom circuit. It means you need to use, for example, a breadboard or you need to design a custom resistor layout to actually have capacitive sensing. It means you need to assemble out of the breakout board. It's not embedded right, I, by defect. I meant the, the, the embedded one. like The embedded the one, circuit. exactly. That means the ESP8266 doesn't have embedded touch sensing on it. Okay, but actually, great, even if they have embedded, I always recommend to do it on your own because you can control much more how sensible the board is by changing just a few components like one or two resistors and you can control. For example, <coughs> how, what kind of things we can do, for example, with capacitive sensing. Capacitive sensing is actually, is here, capacitive sensing we have it's a time of sensing that we just use the conductivity of the materials. And we are measuring, for example, if you have, let's say here, I have a piece of metal. I'm, as a person, I have my foot connected to the floor. I am kind of pulled to low. I'm grounded, let's say. So if I touch this piece of metal, I'm changing small micro variations of the voltage and I can read them. So for example, if this, um, this caliper is connected to the Arduino or the MCU or whatever, and I have a differential divider, a, di a divider, resistor divider, I can measure difference in the voltage. The distances in the voltage are going to be really, really, really small, but we still can measure them. So we, just when we touch, it's not the same touching here than touching here, because we have more resistance on the metal between this zone and this zone to the microcontroller. So actually we can measure this resistance. And how sensible is the resistance and how sensible is the circuit prone to fail. And actually that's the part that Oscar is gonna cover on how to actually clean these noisy signals. So actually capacitive sensing is, we use it every day and it's in all the devices we use all the time. For example, uh, you have your, your TV when you touch the TV to switch it on, it doesn't have a button. Some of the TVs have you touching them. That is a capacitive sensor. Most of your like um, cooking plates at home, if they are electric ones, you are touching and mix click. Actually, this is capacitive sensing. Also, 
your smartphones. Actually, your smartphones are thousands and thousands of capacitor sensing, but just in an array. Let's go with simple examples. For example, this is how to make a banana piano. So basically, everything that is conductive onto a point could be measured on the capacitive way. Why? Because of the water content of the material. So actually, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight capacitive sensors. Each one calibrated. What? When you touch sensor one, it makes a different sound. Sensor two, it makes another different sound. This is a simpler array of having eight capacitive sensors connected in a row. Everything can be measured in a capacitive way. Some materials are easier than other ones. Of course, if you connect just a wire to your table, it's going to be really, 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 really low conductive. It's really have a really low of conductive electricity. So that means it's gonna be really difficult to measure. We could do it, yes, but you will need to have a what is called an amplifier of signal. So actually you can amplify that small variation. As most of you will not have this kind of circuit at home, I recommend you to use something that is more or less conductive. Fruits or paper aluminum foil will also work really well. But almost any kind of metal and some kind of plastic sponge also will work. I will put these links also on the page. For example, this is how capacitive screens work. Um, the video was here, let me see. Okay. Is this video? No, it's not this video. Ah, it's this video, sorry. I will close this one. So actually when you touch your screen, what you have is an array of sensors what is called touch sensing. So you have one line, one electric line, could be copper, in this case of a screen, it's a different material that's semi-transparent. You have another line, another line, and another line, and you have another line in the Y direction, the Y coordinate. So actually, when you touch this point, you are activating this line and this line. This one is a matrix, so the design is slightly different. So actually, by getting activation of these two at the same time, you actually get the position because you're activating multiple cap sensors at the same time. It's more or less like the game of how to sync the float, like sync your navy. You say A5, okay, sync or water. It's more or less the same. So actually, you are just crossing coordinates on a multiple devices sensing. So when you touch this one, when you exactly, for example, X3 and X5, the devices knows by crossing all the array that you have touched this point. Multi-touch screens are slightly more complex, but they work on the same concept. So for example, how we know this on the phones and how we do this. Actually, the phones have different layers that when you break your screen and you go to the chinos that they fix it, you might have seen that you have your LCD panel and you have the array of sensors that is one of the the x array and the y array and by changing the matrix between one of both is how you sense and actually you never touch your capacitive sensing matrix because you have a glass that is protecting everything on the top what they have done is calibrate the sensor so actually you can feel you can activate that sensors just behind a glass, a thin glass. And actually some like cool projects or like charging tables that actually IKEA has some pieces of furniture that you touch your table on some corner and you activate things, for example, charging or switching on an LED, a light. It's actually because you can calibrate a capacitive sensor to feel above a material that is not conductive. And let's go onto this part. So actually, capacitive sensing is one of the most simplest uh, sensors that you can do at home. And you can do it with almost anything. What you basically need is some cables and resistors. The bad point of this is you will need kind of different types of resistors to have different calibrations of sensors. So you don't have like 20 types of resistors, you might not be able to calibrate until the sensitivity that you want. So as Victor was saying, we have a 
what? We have a resistor that is actually the voltage divider that it was explaining in this part. Let's go over it. Mm -hmm. What is it? It's this part. It's pull to low. Sorry, it's the voltage divider. It's exactly this part. We need to make a comparison. Why? Because we need to see what is the electric conductivity. When we are not touching, we need to feel something and we need to translate it on how actually when we touch, we make the small change in the resistance. And we are measuring really, 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 really small sensing. The resistor, you will need to actually use this uh, type of inputs are usually one mega ohm. That is, means when you want to touch directly the sensor, it means aluminum copper foil. And we are changing every time to a almost 10 times or four times resistor. When you change to a 10 mega ohm, you can actually touch in the air your sensor. That is quite cool. It feels like a Jedi, like feel the force. So what, why we need to actually increase the sensors that much? Any clue? Come on, <laughs> nobody? Because Wait, actually, what? why we need to increase like 10 times the resistance, the resistor to actually be able to touch in the air. No idea. Because uh, of conductivity? Exactly. Air is yeah. conductive. It's also conductive. And actually, this is how lightning strikes fly through the air because air could be somehow conductive. What happened? We don't have a really high voltage. That is an easy way to actually make a lightning strike that travel to the air. We don't want to kill you when you touch in the air your sensor. So actually, we are seeing little, 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 really small voltage differences on the near area field of the, for example, aluminum plate. So how to actually we can increase the, resist the sensitivity by increasing R2 resistor. Because if you increase air to resistor, you actually have to augment a lot the little differences to actually have be able to sense with the, let's say, LDR. In this case, that is not an LDR, but is it? Is the amount of electricity flying through the air between your hand and the copper tape or aluminum plate. So higher you go, also, it means that you will have a lot of travels to a calibrated well because maybe just uh, having wind coming through the room will also change a little bit the sensitivity and the electricity translation in the air. So actually, more sensible you make the sensor, it means farther you can activate it, easier will be to actually have fake activations or fake readings. That's why most of the devices, for example, your cooking plate at home, you actually need to kind of press more or less hard to activate it. Why? Because it's an environment that you don't want to have fake readings because it's a dangerous device, it's a heating device. So actually you have reduced a lot the sensitivity. So in case a water drops goes on the, on the surface, you don't get a fake activation. But for example, some digital ATVs are really sensible because you just, they just want to make the gesture really subtle, like, ah, I touch and my TV switch on. So you want to have kind of these interfaces. Also, something that helps a lot is having small capacitors. Why? <clears throat> because when you make a small touch, you get a voltage spike that sometimes is really small. You just sense a little bit. So actually with the capacitor, what you are doing is instead of having a small peak, you are making a larger peak in the time. So actually you are storing a little bit that is small activation. So actually the Arduino or the microcontroller you are using can see it better in time. Um, something that is really important and I strongly recommend you is don't have all the wires like tangled around each other. Why? We are measuring really, really small devices as changes in the electricity current. So actually having two lines connected parallel to each other 
if one gets activated and you have maybe the capacity to sense it really sensible, this one is gonna have an electricity change. So actually what you are doing is making this one vibrate electric, electrically a little bit according to the next one. So actually you want to have the cables as far as possible to each other. Because when you have electricity going through a cable, we have electromagnetic, let's see if I can one, electromagnetic cable interference. Yes, so actually when you have electricity going through a cable, you are producing an electric current that is rotating in a direction. It's like the normal of the, of the cable also. So you have a cable next to each other, you are making the cable that is next to it, the, you are making the electrons rotate in the same and by so producing electricity in a little bit of that cable. So you have multiple cables all tangled to each other, you can produce interference between all the cables. So the best tip I can give you is always twist the cables all to each other. So they are connected and the magnetic fields get erased between the cables. It's really, really important. This is to be actually really picky with uh, capacitive sensing. But in case you are getting fake activations that you don't know why, it might come because of that. So simple capacitive sensors, how to do them? I have a question. Yes. So when, for example, in the phone, we having like a two different grids on top of each other. So they're kind of getting this interference, right? So how are you fixing that? Mm -hmm. Because we, ha we have two grids on top of each other and they, yes. it's gonna be like, have an interface. Actually, like they don't do it exactly in this way. The, the basic concepts are the same but we had, they have a lot of filtering by software and they have a specific chipsets just controlling this part. So it's super hard to have like a grid to detect a capacitive sensor, right? Uh, in a really small scale? No, like see. in laptop scale, for example. Actually, right. yes, yeah, something, something that divide, uh, touch devices and uh, touch screens it was quite difficult to hard them. You don't remember the first screens that you were actually needed to put a lot, and sometimes you have a pen. Yeah. That is the a- Resistive screens, right? Exactly, that's a resistive screen that is a different type from the capacity that we use right now, because yeah. actually the capacitive were not calibrated and not good enough, and were actually too sensible. And actually how to mm -hmm. clean the signal processing took more time the resistive ones. So to connect actually a capacitive sensor, what do you need? It's two cables, <laughs> a resistor, and another cable connected to whatever thing you have at home. You can even just touch the cable. So actually the circuit is really, really, really easy. For that, you need to use a library that is gonna do most of the work for you. It's called the Capacitive Sensor Library for Arduino that is quite straightforward and what it's gonna do is read the sensor each 30 milliseconds. You can change the numbers and a little bit to calibrate these kind of things, but Oscar will explain this part much better than me. Um, okay. And Edu, uh, the yes. other day when we were talking about the, my panel project and you said like, uh, I have to be careful with capacitive sensors, like the thing about sensitivity and that, can you, can you explain a little bit more about that? Uh, yes, in your case, it's a little more complex because you want to have like a lot of sensors. That means uh, when you, can I draw here and not take, can I draw my screen? Yes, I'm gonna open paint. Wait, stop annotation, how to stop this. Mm -hmm. In your case, you're gonna have, uh, let's say your microcontroller, and your touchpad. No, more or less, let's say you have four 
for paths yeah. connected to your microcontroller. Yes. Okay, this one you will have to power to positive and negative. And in some cases, for example, making this to the battery, this is creating current in a direction that actually is making the atoms, the electrons, vibrate in one direction. So actually, just where you wire your multi-touch will can actually have changes and make the electrons get activated vaguely just because you have the main power line close to them. So actually, how you clean your wiring in capacitive is quite important, especially in your case because you want to have a one PCB with everything embedded. So actually, right. that means you cannot have everything far away from each other. Yeah, actually, I want to have like two PCBs, so one only with the buttons and then the other with all the components. So what I'm thinking is that, is there any way that I can like paint something on the bottom layer of the exactly. top? Exactly. So in your case, what you want, for example, is I'm looking from the side of the PCB. This is yeah. just a plate. You have the buttons, like the touch buttons is just pieces of copper. Yeah. You have the wiring coming three-dimensionally, more or less. <laughs> This is the PCB three dimension. Okay. So you want to have use, for example, double side copper, that this side is also copper. And what right. you will do is ground this one, the other side. So actually you don't cannot have interference three dimensionally. You can okay. hide interference maybe in the 2D top plane, but not on the bottom plane. Because if you have, for example, uh, let's say a power regulator here, the power regulators also produce a lot of noise. Right. So actually, you don't want to have that this noise goes through the board. You want to bounce it back. That's great. That's great. OK, thank you. Also, do you have some type of cabling that is really useful that is called shield cables. That actually, for example, HDMI cables have always this kind of cabling. So you have the wires and you have a mesh around the cables that is grounded to actually avoid interference between cables. Usually you only need this if you have a really small digital signals that can have interference between because you have another cable that is power signal next to it. And that's one of the main reasons why, for example, you can find HDMI cables of 100 euros and HDMI cables of three euros. Because the 100 euros have two or three coverings of shielding between each cable, after between two cables and after three cables, and also the shielding is made of aluminum or is made out of gold or is made of copper. Also depends on the material you are using. <coughs> so, Adafruit, as always, has a super, super nice guide on actually how to use capacitive sensing. And it's step by step explain how to calibrate each part. I would really recommend that if you use this uh, capacitive sensing, you go on to Adafruit guide. How you can go back, okay. More kind of sensors, uh, some of you, especially for the MDF, uh, you don't have or you are not interested or in actually make your sensors. So what kind of sensors you are, you can easily find on the market? Actually, the sensors you can find is what we call breakout boards. That is sensors already with the resistor embedded onto them. We saw with, with Victor, that, for example, to connect an LDR, LDR, we need to have a resistor connected to it, no? To have proper readings. We cannot connect this straightforward. So the commercial breakout boards that you find, actually, if you look at them, for example, let's say what is an LDR, yeah, here, they have already the resistor embedded onto it. Yeah, it's really small, so I'm trying to zoom. So for example, here, this is the small resistor that you need. So actually what they do is have like all the 
uh, mandatory components that you need to read already embedded onto these boards. So actually, you don't need to actually put the register because the register is already on it and is straightforward. So let's go one by one of the type of sensors and how, what kind of things we can easily sense without getting too much um, headaches. Or what kind of the commercial sensors you do find. We do have heartbeat, light tap. Actually, light tap is a sensor that, as Victor was stating, if you are just reading light, if the, a cloud comes in, it's going to make a little different in lighting. So you're going to read this. But let's say you want to have it uh, less noisy signal by hardware. So actually, you have a light that is making pulses. And you are measuring at the same time of the pulse. So actually, you have a like a steady signal that you can measure it. And you, what you do is comparison or uh, yeah, comparison of signals. You have uh, this one is an output, is a LED. You have infrared sensors that actually is LEDs that are infrared sensors, the if infrared LEDs. Sorry, that what they do is measure light, but in a different wavelength. Is upper infrared sensing and so actually is the uh, the ones that you see on the, the use on the remotes of everything like your air conditioner, your phone, your TV, etc. Actually, if you want to check these LEDs, there is something that is funny that is take a, a switch on the camera of your phone and put the remote next to the camera, and actually you will see on the camera of your on the screen of your phone the LED blinking in kind of blue because the camera of your phone is able to capture the ultraviolet or infrared sensing uh, emission of your LED. We have also HAL sensors. HAL sensors are magnetic field sensors. They measure differences in magnetic fields. Actually, you can use this sensor, for example, if you're at home and you want to make a hole in the wall and you don't know if there is a pipe behind it, you can actually use this sensor to check for pipes in walls. And actually, it's a really com it's a commercial device that, that the plumbers have it and buy. But actually, it's easy to make it. Temperature and humidity. Tap model. Tap model, how it is, is actually a coil that has a little bar on, on the bottom part. So actually, when you vibrate the coil, the coil, a coil vibrates like blue. So actually, when you vibrate the coil, it touches. So actually, it's called tap model because you make a little piece of hardware, piece of metal, touch each other. Photoresistor, that is a LDR, that is a resistor that changes because of light. Analog temperature is also a resistor that changes, but just with temperature changes. What is different between this one and this one? That will be a digital one. Temperature humidity sensor is called DH11 or DHT22 are digital sensors. They process the, the signal digitally. Uh, you have joysticks that is basically it's a potentiometer but in two directions, in X and Y. And we have these that are slightly different. You see they have kind of, what is this? And they have a blue part. These are mixed digital and analog sensors. They are not digital by so, actually this sensor are always analog. For example, we have the flame or the sound. We have a, basically it's a small speaker that you are measuring the sound pressure. So more sound, it makes the speaker is moving down and upper with the frequency of their sound. That is an analog Should signal. Should it be a, a microphone instead of a speaker if it's reading the information? A micro, the difference actually between a microphone and the speaker is just on the sensitivity and the size of the components. But physically, it's the same. And the microphone for Arduino, that is an 8-bit processor, could not be done, could not only done by sampling sound pressure, not a voice or a music or not tones, let's say. This microphone sensor actually is really making an analog signal. But these breakout boards, what they do is translate this into digital and analog. A normal template of an analog sensor is you have the negative, 
the positive and the analog out. Why these ones they have four? Let's go slightly closer to them. <coughs> it's because they have the ground positive, the analog from the sensor is straightforward, and they have the digital. How, what they do? Actually, this is kind of a transistor. So this is a potentiometer. You remember where it's a potentiometer? It's kind of a screw or a roller that you can regulate. So with this one, you regulate if the analog signal goes higher than the threshold, the threshold is a value that you have set up just by turning this screw, this one produces a one, a digital. So actually it's having an analog sensor that you produce a digital based on a threshold that you activate with this small potentiometer. So actually it's a fake digital, but it's not fake, but you are producing the digital sensor, the digital signal or the threshold by a physical regulation instead of by, of a software. So actually in my personal opinion, I always recommend to use these sensors in analog and do, the, and do the threshold or the activation point by software that you can do it in a more accurate way and you can clean up noise that is a DSP reading and processing of signals. These boards, you can also find them sometimes in blue or red, but for example, other sensors, for example, gas sensors are more complicated or gyroscope position sensors. Those ones, they have to talk with protocol. As Victor stated just in the last second, what you are doing is they have a microcontroller embedded into the sensor and what you do is ask for information. The microcontroller embedded already knows what is the calibration of the sensor and what you're doing is like saying, okay, sensor, sensor number 235, that is the name that the sensor has, for example, tell me the gas, the sensing, the gas that is in the room and the sensor answers directly the number of the correspondingly calibrated value of that sensor. For example, I have 10 milligrams of CO2. Those are digital protocols of communication. That is the part that uh, Victor was talking about that is serial, SPI, and I2C. You might want to use them, but I don't recommend it just in your first goal to go on these kind of sensors because they imply some more libraries to actually process the signal. But actually most of the sensors, for example, that are good and you can do it in an accurate way. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Oscar, but the uh, smart citizen actually uses almost all the sensors are I to C, no? Yeah, actually in the urban board, which is the like normal board that we have is everything is I square C. That has some benefits in the hardware way because you have only less, you have less cables, etc and you can have more calibrated sensors from the factory that you can still want to do some um, pro, uh, in, uh, data cleaning, but they are more accurate in a way. So let's go on to actually- Question, if, if I can. Yes. Um, in that dual analog and, and digital sensor, the digital one only gives zero or one, doesn't give um, zero to, 20, to 25 or something, right? No, it doesn't give you a, a PWM that is a digital signal that with modulation. All right, thanks. Yeah, so that's why I say it's fake digital because it's not native to the native to the sensor, but you are doing you have an intermediate transistor that actually is have making producing the digital. Just to clarify that for one second, um, a little comment. Sorry. Uh, yes. is that there are two steps into the um, digital analog and analog. So one thing is that we read a sensor um, in a digital way, um, which is uh, we are only going to read a zero or a one, a higher or a low or whatever, or we're going to read it in an analog way in which we will read with an ABC. And the other thing is that the sensor itself uh, the way we interface with it is through a digital protocol. And that digital protocol is, for example, like a I square C, 
in this case, we will ask the sensor uh, a question like, give me the data. And when it returns the data, it returns it through a digital protocol, in this case, AI square C, SPI, and so on. So we will see all of this. Uh, when we say digital sensors, many, many times we're talking about this type of sensors in which we interface through a network protocol. And that is not a, um, a just a, a single value, let's say. It's, there's a little bit more complexity and we will see the, these things in the um, networking uh, uh, and communication week. Yeah, let's see in that week better. <laughs> so they don't get too messed up. Uh, okay, so input. What more input sensors you can do or what kind of sensors you can do at home in case you don't have any breakout boards, let's say. Like I'm isolated in the middle of a jungle or an island, and in this case you're home, and you only have an Arduino, some cables and resistors or even, even not resistors. Actually, you can do capacitive sensing without resistors, but you will get really random values. It will be really difficult to calibrate. So I just made a small compilation of different sensors that you can make at home. For example, you can make four sensitive sensors, shock sensors, plant moisture sensor, capacitive sensing, flex vent sensor, and proximity sensors. Actually, for me, being a DIY compilation, it's not that bad. So <clears throat> this one, what we're going to use is um, what we need is cables, two pieces of metal, could be copper tape or just a small aluminum foil tape that you might have at home, and conductive foam sponge. This is something that you might not have, but you can more or less produce it. Uh, so the electronic boards and the electronic components, they come sometimes with a sponge that is a black sponge. That sponge is conductive. How you can make this sponge at home? You can, for example, cut uh, your cleaning sponge, your Bileda sponge, and break out a pen and the graphite, smash it to create a power and make the sponge be sucked into this power of graphite. You know the pens. Yeah, Andrea, your face. <laughs> uh, <laughs> pens, like writing pen, a pencil, sorry. They have the graphite, you know? Mm. This actually is graphite. This is conductive. This is carbon. Actually, it's a really, really similar structure to the diamonds, but we don't consider these diamonds, it's funny. Um, so actually, you can break out this and make fine dust. So whatever you impregnate with this will become conductive at a point. So actually, you can mix, take a sponge, for example, cut a little piece or make it a little bit wet with a water solution of this and graphite, and you will have a conductive sponge. And more than conductive is a variable resistor. Why? Because if you compress the sponge, if you have the sponge like this, you have a lot of different ways so the electricity goes between one side and the other. If you compress the sponge, the path is much shorter. So actually, this is a variable resistor. It will be the same as a potentiometer, but this is a sponge potentiometer. So let's go on to this. So actually what you need is pieces of metal or just cables or aluminum foil tape, the one that you use for wrapping up uh, your things, your cooking things, and you glue a little bit the sponge to the aluminum one. Be careful when you glue, don't, you, don't cover everything with glue because glue by so is not conductive. Or you use double side tape, also it's not conductive. So actually don't cover all the surface. And what you will do is with a multimeter, if you don't have a multimeter, you can connect a straight forward to the Arduino and read the analog value, but it's better to do it with a multimeter. So you actually know more or less the resistance of your, of your sensor and you connect it to with a resistor in parallel. It's the same as 
school why i'm here sorry uh, victor was stating always with an analog sensor we need to have a reference voltage that reference voltage we do it with another resistor so if you know if you have a multimeter you can measure the maximum and minimum of the resistance and you take more or less the middle one and you put a resistor based on that number what happens if you don't have a multimeter that some of you might not have actually you will need to connect the board in this way and try different kinds of resistors one by one from the smaller values to actually the bigger values until you get correct readings or more or less some values that change up and down when you press or not someone, you someone stop or until we burn it <laughs> it will not burn don't worry edu can you solder on aluminum foil uh, you don't need to solder actually it's aluminum foil so i just wrap the table around it <laughs> but, but you can solder yes or not but it's yeah, it will take more time but you can do it for that if you want to solder i will make three layers of aluminum so you have a, th a thicker surface Hello? Yeah, and also, if um, if you can, um, if you have some conductive tape, then you can also close the soldering with some tape on it, so that it doesn't come off because the solder is not going to touch very well. Yeah. I mean, it will, but it it's very fragile, so any tension will break it. You hold the cable with. I will. I will always make. For example, if this is the. Sorry, I'm taking a folio. Moving the screens. If this is a piece of aluminium and this is the cable, I always put a big connection and I just step over it to fix the cable properly. All right. Okay, more sensors that we can do at home. A speaker. I'm pretty sure that you have an old speaker, city speaker, promotional speaker that they have given you as a gift in a fair or something. Or if not, and you're brave, you can disassemble a speaker and assemble it back again. <laughs> it's some headphones work, a things. I've got some. Yes, they also work. Yeah, headphones, like there are smaller speakers in a fan. Yes, yeah. you need to be street sensible when you disassemble them. Something that you need to know about uh, headphones, speakers, I don't know, speaker here down, is actually the cable that comes on the headphones, uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, not the best one, but these cables are usually raw copper stick to each other. Why? And they are usually blue, green, and red. So these cables, they don't have a protective plastic around them. What they do have is a bag of resin. So these cables are not conductive if you just wire them together. So what you need to do is take a lighter and burn the cable, the, the, the copper cable, and you will see that the color comes out and it will make a bad smell because it's the resin burning out. It's the only way that you can make it conductive. If not, you will not be able to solder onto this cable. So what is the sensor? So actually it's taking the same a speaker and connecting in a series with another resistor because this is actually a, another variable resistor. They are measuring the changes. Usually the sensitivity of all the speakers is four or eight ohms. But as the voltage they need to activate it is quite higher, than usually the five volts that we use, we will use a 220 ohms resistor that is the same that you might use for the LEDs. But as always, this depends mostly on the speaker size that you might have. These ones are, for example, 30 watts speaker, that is the typical Bluetooth speaker that everybody has in the parks. So for example, for Benji, for a small headphone speaker, I will use a smaller resistor. And here already you have the, the code on also how to calibrate 
what is the minimum and maximum. And humidity sensor, for example, how to measure water in the plant, if you need to uh, water your plant or not. Again, everything is conductive. So I'm just putting examples of the same kind of uh, sensor, but in different packages. <laughs> So in this case is how to measure your flat. What you need is what? Two cables <laughs> and a resistor again. And what you basically do is put the cables in your flower pot. In this case, you have an LED that is example is to bright the LED in green, yellow or red in case you have to water your plant or not. But the best way is actually take two metal bars, two screws or nails, nails actually work really well like long nails wrap the cable around them and just put them inside the earth of your flower pot because what we're going to do is measure the resistivity change of the soil of your of your plant why the, the soil changes resistivity because of the water content of your plant to get more or less accurate readings you need to put the two screws more or less uh like five to ten centimeters apart if you are if you don't get readings actually i would recommend to first make a calibration and it's just use a glass and put the both screws inside the glass of water and you will see that will be a full humidity just now take them out put them in the air and that will be like zero conductivity and with that you can get more or less the threshold and see if the sensor is working or not or if you need to change the resistor to actually get full readings or not. And the last one that is a sponge sensor that is a variable resistor. This is a slider, the same that for your music volume on your hi-fi or your father hi-fi because nobody has five hi-fis now. Uh, that is actually using the sponge again with graphite. So actually graphite and pens nowadays are really useful. Pens, or aluminum foil paper, and sponges is your next Fab Academy sensor. And proximity sensor. This is, I don't think you will want to tear down your TV remote, but maybe somehow you have an LED and an infrared LED sensor. Infrared LED sensor actually is the same as an LED, but they are kind of bluish, like violet, dark bluish is the way because with this color they have a taint that only filtrates the infrared sensing the infrared lights so yes i have a photo resistor would it work if you use a normal led and a photo resistor for example instead of an infrared uh it will work the same but you will head get fake readings of the normal ambient light so what you can do, Benji, is close yourself in the restroom if your restroom doesn't have a window and do it in the dark. Yeah. So actually with the light of your LED and the sensing, you can, getting closer to the wall, you can sense the distance sensing. What you will do is like an environment that doesn't disturb your readings, that will be, for example, a dark room. On the but mic. it will work. Also, something that is quite important into these devices. And this is why, for example, if you take your TV remote, the LED is not out, it's kind of inside and in a pipe, is you always want to pipe this sensor. So actually you only get front readings. You don't get lateral readings. It's the same as the horses. You want to cover their eyes, so they only go in a straight line. You can do it the same, just making a 3D print pipe or using a small straw and cover the sensor so they only see in one direction. And actually what they do is uh, you will have an emitter that will be the normal LED or infrared LED and the receiver. In case you don't have an infrared LED, it will also work with a normal LED, not as well, but it still will work. And actually it's the same as the ultrasonic sensor. How the ultrasonic sensor? Do you remember what is the ultrasonic sensor? Ultrasonic sensor, is really common, everybody loves it. 
is this kind of sensors. What they have, this is just a microphone and a speaker. Actually, what you is an ultrasonic speaker. What they are doing is sending sound and getting reflection back from the object. And the microphone is measuring the sound of ultrasonic sound coming out from this sensor. Actually, if you have a cat, I'm curious because usually animals have better hearing than us. Point the ultrasonic speaker to your cat, maybe it will do something weird because maybe it's hearing the sound. I never tried, but I always was curious about it. Um, so basically, what you do is get in the LED. It's always better to cover both, not only one, and projecting light and bouncing it back. If this is also what you do with, for example, LiDAR, that is laser rangefinders. They do the same, but they do a laser, so they get really powerful light and they measure the bounce back from the laser. And DIY flex bed sensor, that again, uh, what you do is paint a piece of paper with your pen, not really difficult. And by changing the bending of the paper, also change the resistance on the graphite. Because when you bend the paper in this direction, you have more distance of, of the graphite in a section than in this direction. And actually, they are quite easy to make sensors, quite straightforward. And with that, more or less, DIY sensing <laughs> has been covered. And now we can do on, because these sensors, OK, they are, they are, you can do it, and they, but you will produce a lot of like noise data and noise values based on these sensors, because they are not accurate. They had not been manufactured with all the same amount of graphite all around. So actually, the part that Oscar is going to do right now is really, really, really important. And it's the only way, that actually, even if you are using commercial boards, if you want to have professional results, it's the only way that you can do it. That is the DSP sampling. That is how to actually process the data we are reading to get good results. And with that, all yours, Oscar. Stop share. I think probably we can, uh, how about we take a uh, three minute break um, and then we, then we come back.